Hello, well it's time for part two in our protein synthesis video and this week we're thinking about translation. So, Rachel and CC, are we ready? Here we go. Da 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 da, it's a video. Da 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 da, let's start the video. And start we shall. You'll remember that we got to this point in our last video. We were thinking about transcription being the process by which we get a bit of DNA, we copy a small bit of that DNA to RNA or mRNA here, messenger RNA. That then leaves the nucleus and now we can get onto the business of translation. Translation is where we actually make that protein that is the goal of this whole process. And we use this illustration of a hard drive being where we might keep the DNA, so that's like the nucleus, and we'll make a copy of just a small amount of the DNA there uh, onto our flash drive here and that flash drive is like the mRNA being taken out of the nucleus but carrying that little bit of information with it and its destination is the ribosome this structure which you can just about make out faintly here now as we do this we're going to actually encounter two other types of RNA we're going to encounter this type tRNA or transfer RNA and ribosome which is made partly out of rRNA but that's not something we need to worry about at GCSE. This is tRNA. Now again just like mRNA the one we met before it is single stranded and it's actually made in exactly the same way. The difference here is that though it's still single stranded this single strand loops back on itself and there are regions where the bases line up in complementary fashion and they pair up giving us what is called a clover leaf shape like this there we go there's our clover leaf shape um, sometimes there's a little bump there and then to this bit here is where we attach our amino acid just as we've got on this figure here so we've got two important parts of the tRNA molecule. The bit up here where the amino acid is bound onto, but also this bit here on the bottom loop of the clover. That is called the anticodon, and it's really important. We've got a series of three bases here, C, G, G. That is so important because we're going to have complementary base pairing with these three to a region on the mRNA where there will be the corresponding complementary three bases. This bit here is called the anticodon because this section of three here on the mRNA is called the codon. Let me just draw it over here, see if we can illustrate this. Here we have our mRNA, as we drew before, and it's got bases all the way along it. And it's drawn very badly. Now these bases come in threes, so maybe this is AUA, and this bit here is GC. A, I don't know if I'm doing capitals or lowercase here, Blah, who knows? And then this bit here is G, C, C. Now this codon here, G, C, C, will match this anticodon here. So this tRNA with its clover leaf shape, with its bottom end here, this base loop here of C, G, G, can just come in here and bind the C to the G, the G to the C, and the G to the C here. And as it does, remember, this is bound to an amino acid. So this tRNA can bring with it this amino acid here to line up always by this part of the mRNA where you have G, C, C. That's going to be absolutely crucial. Now let's do that a few times in a row. These tRNAs here are represented in a different way, not a nice clover leaf shape, but this will help simplify it. Here goes, oh let's take this one here. Here comes a tRNA and it's got 
as its anticodon AAG. It's got at the top of it, bound on, phenylalanine, abbreviated here to phi. And because its anticodon is AAG, so it can come on and bind to where it finds on the mRNA UUC. And it won't bind anywhere else. It'll only bind where the A finds a U, this A finds another U, and this G finds a C. So it's only going to bind where it finds its complementary codon. I'm going to write that here. That means wherever you get UUC on messenger RNA, you will always get this tRNA with AAG and therefore always phenylalanine. So if you want phenylalanine at a particular point in your protein, you make sure you get on your mRNA UUC. Therefore, can you see that we will guarantee when you've got AAA, you'll get lysine. When you've got GAU, you'll always get aspartame. And when you get UUC, it'll always be phenylalanine. This is a handy table. You would never, ever need to memorize this table, but it's really useful. This is our first letter on the codon. That's therefore the mRNA. This is our second letter here. And then our third letter, because it's a triplet code, is this one here. Or oh, here we go. Du -du -dum, du -du 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 -dum. Let's just quickly return to our first one. It was GCC on the mRNA. So let's find out what GCC codes for on that table. G is our first letter. So we're looking for GCC. G. OK, so it's going to be along this column here. Second letter, C. Right, so we're in this one here. And third letter, also C. So our amino acid will be alanine. There's another little quirk that you might be able to see here. For alanine, doesn't really matter what the third letter of the codon is. GCU will give you the same amino acid as GCG. It'll give you alanine. That's not always the case. It often is the case, but not always. If you look at aspartic acid, which I think I called alanine aspartate earlier, it matters whether you've got a C or U at the end versus an A or a G as your final codon. So that takes us back to here. What is DNA and what's it for? Well, now do you see we've got a means of taking our bases here, the letters of our bases, and turning that into a sequence of amino acids. And in fact, we can look down here. We've got a T, then we've got a C, then we've got an A. And let's just pause there, because this will give us, on when we make a, an mRNA copy of it via transcription, that will give us a little tiny stretch of RNA with A, G, and U. We can go back to our table and see what that would code for. First letter A, second letter G, third letter U, A, G, U, serine. So this part here will always code for serine. So here, if this is the first bit, this amino acid would be serine. And we could work this out all the way along our amino acid chain. Now that means that our amino acid chain will definitely always be in the same sequence. And as it's the sequence which gives the folding and then the three-dimensional shape, and as it is the three-dimensional shape that gives the function, the series of bases on the DNA, ultimately give the function of the protein. Let's just jot that down. So the series of the bases on DNA give us the sequence of amino acids, which give us the shape of the protein and therefore the function of the protein. As a little final addendum, 
we've got to think about where this all happens. If you are a prokaryote or e like E. coli, which lives in your gut, you don't have a nucleus. And actually, this can just happen straight off the DNA. So here we have the unwinding of the DNA. There's no nucleus to protect it. And the ribosomes can just latch straight onto here uh, and uh, code away. So ribosome. I don't think I've really focused on those ribosomes very much. And the ribosomes move along. And as they do, the amino acid chain grows as they move. In eukaryotes, which do have a nucleus, we've got a little bit of processing that we've got to do first. Let's not worry about that so much. And then it's transported out. But then this happens in just the same way. The ribosomes come along. They grab the tRNAs. The tRNAs bring amino acids with them. And those chains of amino acids grow as the ribosomes move along. Well, I hope that was in some way helpful. And if nothing else, though, I hope you enjoyed uh, CC and Rachel singing.